Half an hour later, I'm seated once again alongside the other bridal candidates, in a row fifty feet from the stage in the massive underground auditorium. The only difference is that this time, one of us is missing. Holly is gone, and we're down from seven to six. Her elimination last night should be a good thing for me one less rival to compete against, but I'm overcome by a feeling of deep unease, little shivers of fear prickling at my skin like goosebumps. I feel a tight knot of dread twisting in my stomach when I think about the possibilities, about where she might be at this very moment. I sincerely hope it's not a hastily dug hole in the ground. I want to win this game, but right now, what I care most about is just getting through to the next round alive. How was your date with Oliver last night? Shu Mei asks Mara in a hushed whisper, barely audible two seats down from where I sit. Yeah, what's he like? Andrew asks, a little too loudly, but the groomsmen waiting in the aisle don't seem to take note. Mara seems to have calmed down a bit since yesterday. Her ever-present tears and barely repressed panic have been replaced with an eerily calm compliance still downcast and sullen, but more composed and level-headed now. She looks down briefly at the sparkling diamond engagement ring on her finger, the prize that marks her as the girl in the lead our reigning fiancé for a day. Oliver's actually a sort of nice. Mara says, not offering up much, her gaze distant and distracted. He's not at all like his parents. I don't think he wants to be here, either. Hum, is all Andrea says, and she doesn't look pleased by this information. Kim and Svetlana are both listening to every word, but neither betrays any hint of interest or reaction. That's what I thought, too. Xu Mei says. He's not a willing participant. Perhaps he'll find a way to help us. Whoever wins the next round should try to speak to him alone on tonight's dinner date, if possible. We could all work together, and with him on our side, we might be able to. Might be able to do what? Svetlana cuts in, her voice icy and dripping with sarcasm. Escape. He's wearing one of these promise rings, just like the rest of us remember. The only way out of this competition is through it. And I plan on getting all the way through to the very end. Not if I beat you to it, Andrea says insolently, the challenge clear in her voice. She and Svetlana stare daggers at each other until the heavy red velvet curtains part ever so slightly on the stage before us and Cynthia Winsworth slips through and walks to the front. She is dressed immaculately as always. Today's outfit is a cream pantsuit with a chic tailored blazer and dress pants and pale blush pink stiletto heels. Good morning, ladies, Cynthia says, smiling down at us, noting the looks of confusion and bewilderment and perhaps disappointment on our faces. Yes, yes, that's right, it's just us girls today. The boys are attending to important business matters this morning and will be likewise engaged all day. Fear not, however, my dear blushing brides. Both my husband and my son will, of course, attend this evening's judging ceremony, and the winning fiancé will enjoy a date with Oliver, as she is rightly due. Good, Andrea mutters under her breath, just loudly enough for me to hear. That date is mine. She shoots a look over to Svetlana as she says this and Svetlana only rolls her eyes. I guess Svetlana's given up the whole mysterious, emotionless poker face thing. I'm glad she quit playing her cards so close to her chest. It was getting unnerving. Now, as I have already mentioned numerous times round two of the wedding game, will be a full day challenge. Cynthia continues speaking up on the stage, oblivious to the small battle of wills happening in the audience down below. The future misses, Winsworth will be the face of not only the formidable Winsworth family, but also of an entire multinational business empire. 
we need someone who can charm the public and investors alike with her grace and presence. As such, we require that she possesses great style, beauty and feminine allure. As I'm sure you will all have noticed by now there is not a single unattractive girl amongst you. Each one of you bridal candidates was selected with aesthetics in mind. You are all natural beauties, each in your own special way. What we aim to do today is to elevate you from natural beauty all the way to exquisite, exceptional beauty. Today is makeover day. All around me, the other girls are murmuring and whispering until one of the groomsmen in the aisle hisses. Shut up. And we fall into silence again. Raise the curtains. Cynthia says, looking up past us at some unseen worker in a control room near the back of the auditorium. The heavy red velvet curtains begin to rise on the massive stage before us. They gradually reveal a bewildering scene. The jewelry display cabinets from last night's challenge have been cleared away, and in their place stand perhaps twenty racks of white dresses on black velvet clothes hangers. The dresses are so tightly packed together that each row could easily hold two hundred dresses, so by my estimation, there might be up to four thousand dresses on stage, give or take. All of them in varying shades of white, cream, and ivory, in a variety of fabrics and lace. Wedding dresses. Thousands upon thousands of wedding dresses, in every style imaginable. Behind the wedding dresses, a row of perhaps one hundred black velvet, faceless mannequin busts, has been dressed up, in every type of wedding veil, everything from small face-covering bird cage, style veils, made from stiff net-like lace, to magnificent floor-sweeping tulle, and organza cathedral veils, embellished with tiny silk ivory flowers and translucent beadwork. Today's challenge will be divided into multiple parts. Cynthia explains. Part one will run until 10.30 am, and we will give you updates on how much time you have left every half hour. Your task is simple select your ideal wedding gown and veil. There are literally thousands of styles from you to choose from, all of them designed by top haute couture fashion icons. The dress sizes of the girls assembled here range from United States size 0 to size 4, so you all fall within a close range. Where possible, we have provided each garment in three sizes 0, 2, and 4, but many of these dresses are one of a kind and are only available in one particular size. Where needed, we have a team of seamstresses on hand to make alterations as you see fit should any problems arise, but I'm confident you will each find a dress that you love if two bridal candidates pick the same dress. The rules for deciding who keeps it are the same as those in yesterday's challenge. You will need to negotiate and use your wits and wiles to secure your first choice. We have set up individual fitting rooms in the stage wings, each with a full-length vertical mirror and excellent lighting to assist you in your final decision. There will also be fitting room assistance on hand, should you need help getting into the gowns. As she says this, six young, plain-looking women dressed in matching uniforms of a light gray pencil skirt, black ballet pumps, and white blouse step out from the stage wings and make a sort of quick half-bowing gesture, offering their service to us, before retreating back into position. After you have found the perfect dress and veil, we move along to part two of this second round. Cynthia continues. You will be shown a variety of bridal jewelry, shoes, tiaras, lingerie, garters, and other accessories. You will make your selection from these items, and will thereafter break for a brief lunch in the dining room upstairs at 12 noon. You will also be permitted to use the restroom facilities at this time if you wish, escorted of course by one of the groomsmen. After our lunch break, you will be directed to the spa for the rest of the afternoon, where a staff of beauticians, hairdressers, massage therapists, makeup artists, dermatologists, cosmetologists, and manicurists 
will transform you from mere beauties into flawless goddesses. You will have some small say in the choices they make with regards your appearance, for example, hair cut and color, but the final decision lies with me. Part 3 of today's challenge will commence at 7 o'clock this evening, once your makeover is complete. A team of stylists will dress you head to toe in the wedding couture you selected, and you will be escorted back here, where the judges will eagerly await your arrival. You will be judged simply according to whose beauty, charm, and glamour we deem the greatest. In other words, the most breathtakingly beautiful amongst you shall be the winner, and will be presented the engagement ring, currently sitting on Mara's finger, becoming our new fiancé for a day. With this in mind, take care in the selection of your wedding gown, veil, and accessories, as the wrong cut can make even an incredible figure look frumpy or shapeless, and we certainly can't have a frump, as the future fate of the Winsworth Interactive Company. She places both hands on her hips then, subtly flexing to show off her enviably slender, yet curvaceous figure, still perfect and desirable even in her mid to late fifties. Good luck today, girls, she says. May the loveliest lady win? Now, please rise and follow Todd up onto the stage. We have a lot to get through today. We do, as she says, following the groomsmen's, lead her down the aisle and up the stage's steps. Then Todd steps back and joins the other groomsmen at the front of the stage alongside Cynthia, watching as I and the other girls fan out amongst the racks of dresses. Now that I'm actually up here, the task seems simply overwhelming. At the end of each rack, there is a small board with a simple one-word description of the style it houses. My eyes skim the labels reading. A line, trumpet, mermaid, sheath, tea length, ball gown, empire. Fashion has never been my strong suit. I actually like getting dressed up in a pretty outfit from time to time, but usually my day-to-day -day fashion mantra is just, the simpler the better. Ah, oh, the comfier the better. I'm way out of my depth here. Some of the other girls seem more confident and are already sorting through the racks of dresses, looking for their special gown. Andrea has even snatched up three or four shorter T-length dresses and is clutching them protectively against her chest as she moves quickly down the rows, determined not to let anyone else steal her precious finds. A fitting room assistant is trying to help her, offering to take the dresses and hang them up in a changing room, but Andrea impatiently wave her off and continues her frantic search. The sheath and T-length style sound like the simplest, least fussy options, but I'm not going to make the mistake of picking what I prefer. Just as with yesterday's challenge, I have to keep in mind that the real person, we're choosing for the person, we're really trying to make happy here, is Cynthia, not ourselves. The other two judges, Franklin and Oliver, might have some opinions about our hair and makeup makeovers, but I have no doubt that Cynthia will be the main judge when it comes to her bridal couture selection. So I try to think of what she would approve of. Something extremely elegant, refined and regal, but not overly pompous or flashy. Classic, bordering on conservative, modest. In light of this, the A-line, trumpet and possibly mermaid styles are probably my best bet. So I hurry over to those racks and begin the strenuous task of examining each dress one by one. Each is utterly lovely, but after looking at over 30 styles, I finally stumble across a gown that beats all the rest. I take it off the rack and gaze at it for a full minute, taking in every detail. I know the moment I lay eyes on it that it's the dress for me. I always imagined that when I, if I ever got married, I'd probably wear something super simple and casually understated but now, to my surprise, I find myself drawn to the exact opposite. The gown is ethereal and timeless in equal measure, an elegant masterpiece in lace and silk. 
The magnificent dress is crafted from silk taffeta, tulle, and delicate antique brussels, rose point lace with long lace sleeves, and a high neckline, and a fitted bodice tapering down to a graceful billowing bell shaped skirt. To top it all off, the show stopping bridal gown's lace bodice is embroidered with hundreds of tiny lustrous seed pearls, forming an elaborate floral motif. The gown reminds me of Grace Kelly's iconic wedding dress, all but ever so slightly altered for modern tastes. I read the label inside, and I'm not at all surprised to see Oscar de la Renta stitched in dark golden, looping thread on a creamy white slip of fabric. The price tag on this dress alone could probably pay off my student debt ten times over. Damn. Most important of all, I think it has the right balance of refined elegance and timeless glamour to appeal to Cynthia's tastes. So I look over to the fitting room assistant, who has been unobtrusively trailing me at a discreet distance the entire time, and shoot her a friendly smile, hoping to make an ally. The girl looks a few years younger than me, maybe twenty or twenty-one years old. She timidly returns my smile and hurries up to me with outstretched arms, taking the dress to await me in the fitting room. Next, I head over to the veils. Svetlana, Shume, Kim and Mara are still milling around the dress racks, picking out their gowns, and haven't yet made it this far, while Andrea appears to have already raided the veil section and taken a bunch into the fitting room with her, as evidenced by half a dozen bareheaded black velvet mannequins. No matter, I can already see the exact veil I want. In amongst the sea of lace, tulle, satin and taffeta, I spot a lengthy floral embellished ivory lace veil that trails down almost to the floor, delicate and breezy as gossamer spider silk. It's a perfect match for the elegant gown, and so I slip it off the mannequin's head and take it to the fitting room in the stage wings. The fitting room assistant holds open the black velvet curtain for me, ushering me into space where the dress is already hanging up alongside a full-length mirror. As she lets the curtain fall, I realize something huge. We don't have total privacy, but we're pretty much alone in this fitting room, just me and her. She doesn't seem as mean as the groomsman, or as beaten down as the housekeeper who betrayed me this morning. I can speak freely with her. This is my chance to find out where the hell we are, and to possibly even send a message to the outside world. And it might be the last chance I get. I can't screw this up. The moment I'm alone with the assistant, I hurry over to where she stands carefully placing my veil on a coat hook in the corner of the fitting room. Please, you have to help me, I whisper in a hushed, urgent whisper. They're holding us against our will the other girls and I are captives. For a moment, I actually think the girl might actually help me. Her sweet, timid expression is replaced with something akin to shock, and she stares at me in wide-eyed bewilderment. Help me? I whisper. Please. She looks startled for a few seconds, but then she seems to collect herself, and she looks down at her feet, avoiding eye contact with me. I'm only a fitting room assistant, she says. My job is just to carry clothes for you and to help you change into your dress, nothing else. What the? What's your name? I ask, deciding to try another tack. It's Ruby. She whispers hesitantly, looking up at me for a moment, before averting her eyes again. She looks so frightened. Maybe she's younger than I initially thought closer to seventeen or eighteen. Okay. Listen to me, Ruby. I say, taking a step closer to her. I'm trying to keep the anger and frustration out of my voice, but it's difficult. They killed someone in cold blood yesterday. These people are murderers. Please, Ruby. You have to do something. I'm literally begging you. She swallows hard and looks up again, holding my gaze for a moment. I can see in her eyes that she has torn her bottom lip, is quivering with indecision. 
but then she shakes her head, her eyes filling with tears. I'm sorry, she says in a quieter, softer voice. Please understand. I can't. That's bullish tea, and you know it. I snap at the girl, my voice rising in anger. For the briefest of moments, Ruby looks as though she might actually burst into tears, even though I'm the one being held captive and being forced to compete in this f sked up arranged marriage tournament. Why, Ruby? Why won't you help me? Why? The Winsworth family is more powerful than you could ever imagine, is all she says. Well, can you at least tell me where we are? I ask, getting desperate now. Where have they taken us? Are we in Hawaii? Madagascar. The Cook Islands. Where are we? I grab her by the shirt lapels and pull her face closer to mine, my eyes blazing into hers, compelling her to speak. She opens her mouth, about to say something, when I hear loud footsteps approaching over the wooden floorboards of the stage, followed by Todd's booming voice. What the actual FCK are you two talking about in here? The best man shouts as he furiously pushes aside the black velvet curtain, glaring at us both with those terrifying glacial blue eyes of his. Just as well I didn't start changing into the wedding dress yet. It would be awkward to be standing here half-naked with that creep hovering in the doorway. Nothing, just how pretty the dress is. I lie, but he flat-out ignores me, focusing all his attention on Ruby. What did we tell you, dumbass? He snaps at the fitting room assistant. No talking to the contestants. Now do your F-sking job. I'm sorry, sir. The girl squeaks, cowering back into the fitting room, under his icy glare. It won't happen again. It better not. Todd grunts. He forcefully yanks the black velvet curtain closed again, and although he can no longer see Ruby and I, I have no doubt that he can still hear us. He's probably waiting right outside, the fitting room listening in. Ruby is silent for the rest of the time. We're in the fitting room together, and I don't try to speak to her again. It's pointless. Maybe Svetlana's right. The only way out of this stupid game is through it. I guess I better start focusing my attention on winning. Luckily, I have an awesome show-stopping dress, and hopefully that's enough to give me an edge. Ruby works away in silence as I ponder my situation, peeling off my white mini-dress before dressing me in three overlaying petticoats and having me step carefully into his expensive wedding gown. She zips up the back of the dress and adjusts the hems of the long sleeves, slightly, so they sit better over my wrists, smoothing out the delicate lace, and creamy ivory silk. The gown fits me perfectly, like a glove as though it were made just for me. Then she places the veil over my head, draping the lace over my shoulders, and taking her time arranging it to perfection. When she's done, she gestures towards the full-length mirror in the corner of the fitting room, and so I step forward and admire my reflection. The dress and veil are perfect, just as I knew they would be. I'm sure a lot of the other girls will be trying on multiple dresses, trying to decide on their first choice, but I'm 100% certain about my selection. And so I nod and make a quick thumbs-up gesture, and Ruby understands. She helps me out of the dress, a much less laborious task, than getting into it, and puts it back on the clothes hanger, along with the long veil. Then she pushes back the black velvet curtain at the fitting room's entrance and gestures for me to leave. As I suspected, Todd is still lingering outside, keeping tabs on me no doubt. I'm done, I say, to which he raises an eyebrow and smiles. Well, that was quick, he says. Harry, take Specs to the accessories room. Don't take your eyes off her shiz a sneaky one. One of the burly groomsmen steps forward and grabs my upper arm, steering me across the stage and through one of the wings, 
followed closely behind by Ruby in tow. The three of us walk backstage, through an exit door, and down a maze of long, well-lit corridors, until we reach a room, with the words Theater Dressing Room, one engraved on a metal plaque, above the door. The groomsman presses his index finger against the touchpad next to the door, unlocking it. He pulls me into the room, where hundreds know, more like thousands, from the looks of it of shoes, have been arranged on numerous shelves, lining the high walls. There is every bridal-appropriate style and color imaginable, from sparkly silver stiletto-heeled Jimmy Choo's to embellished ivory satin, Manolo Blanick pumps, and more in the center of the dressing room. Brightly lit glass jewelry display cases have been set up, filled with a variety of stunning necklaces, bracelets, earrings, and tiaras, dripping with precious gems and lustrous pearls. There is also a jar filled with old pennies, set aside on an inconspicuous, small table in one of the room's corners. Weird. I wonder what that's about. If you see anything you want to try on, you tell the girl. The groomsman tells me, pointing at Ruby, and she'll get it out of the case, off the shelf for you. Understood. I nod my head in confirmation, and then the groomsman steps back to wait boredly by the door. It's starting to dawn on me, just how lucky I am to be the first one here. I have a real head start meaning, I get first pick of the accessories before the other girls arrive. I decide to pick out my jeweler first. There seems to be a slightly bigger selection of shoes on offer, plus my feet will be totally hidden by the voluminous billowing skirt of my wedding dress anyway, so jewelry's my priority. It doesn't really make sense to wear a necklace with the gown's high lace collar, which means that my choice of earrings is all that much more important. I consider a pair of dazzling chandelier diamond earrings, but decide that they're too large and flashy. The simpler gold and diamond studs are tempting, but eventually I settle on a pair of timeless, classic white pearl drop earrings. Ruby takes them out of the display cabinet for me and sets them aside. I skip the Taurus, altogether wearing one on top of my already elaborate cathedral veil, would just feel like overkill and I instead go straight for the endless rows of footwear. I take my time studying the vast collection of designer shoes until my eyes settle on a lovely pair of white leather Christian Louboutin stilettos. Instead of the signature red lacquered soles, these of pale powder blue, soles a perfect fit for the old something borrowed, something blue adage. I point the shoes out and Ruby fetches them for me in my size. When she returns, I'm about to slip my feet into them, when I notice something small and circular, a dull coppery coin, lying at the bottom of the left shoe. A penny, from that random penny jar in the corner of the room. She must have covertly slipped in there when she went to fetch the shoes, but why? It is a cryptic message. A clue. A warning. Oh! I remember. It comes back to me in a flash something I saw on the History Channel as a child, while watching a documentary about Mississippi plantation owners. It's an old antiquated tradition from the Deep South, where brides would place a penny inside their wedding shoe for good luck on the big day. She's wishing me luck. Thanks, Ruby. I murmur under my breath as I slip the shoes onto my feet and she gives me the briefest ghost of a smile. So I guess I might have a friend on the inside, after all. I take a few wobbly steps in the shoes, finding them to be a perfect fit. They look amazing and aren't nearly as uncomfortable as I'd feared they might be, although I struggle to comprehend why anyone would ever wear these things by choice. The heels on these shoes are least an inch longer than the sparkly stilettos that form part of the bridal candidate's uniform, and somewhat thinner too, like a pair of sharp, dangerous chopsticks. Chopsticks, that's it. These would do a much better job of stabbing out a groomsman's eye than those flimsy plastic chopsticks I was trying to hide under my mattress this morning.
now's my chance. I probably won't get another opportunity like this, where I'm practically alone with just one groomsman and a terrified girl. Screw trying to play this sick, twisted game. Screw winning. I'm getting out. The plan comes together quickly in my mind. I'll take the first shoe off and set it aside. Then, just as the second shoe is coming off, I'll cry out in pain, as if I've gotten my foot caught on something. I'll have a meltdown, until the groomsman comes over to check on me, and then I'll whip the other shoe off my foot, I'll hold it tight and plunge all six inches of that ridiculous stiletto heel into the dude's eye. Then, I'll dash out the door and make a run for it with or without Ruby. So long as she doesn't run straight to tell the others, I might get pretty far before the other groomsmen even find out that I've escaped. Who knows how long the other girls will take picking out their dresses and veils. I might even make it off this goddamned island. It's now or never. Deciding to take the plunge and put my daring plan into motion, before I can chicken out, I slip the first shoe off my foot. Then I gasp and begin to moan and whimper, clutching my foot in my hands as I cry out in mock pain. Ruby backs away in alarm, and out of the corner of my eye, I see the groomsman heading towards us. What's wrong? He asks impatiently, closing in on Ruby and I. Just a little closer, closer. The second he gets within a few feet of me, I spring up at him, wielding the Christian Louboutin shoe in my hand, like a deadly weapon. I'm about to plunge the sharp spike of the heel into his eye when he raises up one muscly forearm, knocking me back. I lunge at him again, and he grabs me roughly by my hair, slamming me hard into the floor. Pain explodes behind my eyelids, and I feel something warm and wet trickling down over my face until I'm lying face down in a pool of my own blood. The last thing I think to myself before I pass out is, I'm gonna have a black eye and a broken nose after this. There go my chances of winning the makeover challenge. I am truly, utterly screwed. And then I sink into the blissful oblivion of unconsciousness. Lavender. I can smell lavender and chamomile and something else. Sweetly fragrant bergamot. Lemongrass, maybe. My eyes flutter open, and I blink up at a gloomy, candlelit ceiling. I turn my head to the side, taking in the blurry sight of a small room, cast in shadows, and the golden glow from several tall moss green candles, arranged in a wrought iron candelabra. I'm lying on some sort of elevated bed. No, a table of sorts. Oh my God, an operating table. And am I naked? I look down and can see some sort of thin white sheet covering my body, the cool, crisp fabric lighting, touching my bare skin. What are they doing to me? I sit up too quickly and I immediately reel from the head rush, a wave of woozy numbness washing over me as the white sheet falls away to reveal my naked chest. Good, you're awake. A woman says from somewhere in the room. She hurries over to my side, and her blurry face comes into view, swimming in the haze above me, as she stands beside the table and pulls the sheet back up to cover my chest. Don't push yourself you've been passed out for almost an hour, so you'll take some time to come right. I think she's smiling down at me, but I can't tell for sure. Damn my stupid short-sightedness. Where are my glasses? I ask. You won't be needing those anymore, the woman says. Oh my God, I must have been eliminated from the competition after I tried to attack that groomsman in the theater dressing room. They're going to take me out to the jungle, and then, then, something strange happens as these morbid thoughts pass through my mind. The face of the woman hovering above me gradually sharpens and comes into greater clarity bit by bit. Now that you're awake, your optical nerve should be sending information to your brain stem. In other words, your implants should be fusing. The woman says, her voice breathless with excitement. 
She shines a small torch into my eyes one after the other, and I blink under the blinding light until she removes it. Good sensitivity, your pupils are reacting well. No swelling or puffiness, how many fingers am I holding up? She steps back a few feet, holding up three fingers. To my amazement, I can see each finger clear as day every minute detail is crystal clear, down to the white tips of her French manicure. I'm seeing clearly without my glasses. Impossible. This isn't just 2020th's vision, it's better than that. The dark, candlelit room now appears brighter, every edge and minutiae standing out in stark contrast. What? What is this? I stammer. What did you do to me? Not me. The woman says breezily. Dr. Ramsurin was the one who implanted the lenses. You're very fortunate a lot of people with poor eyesight would literally kill for early access to this product. The supervisionary eye lenses are still technically in the beta testing stage, at least a year away from release to the general public. So you're one of the first human test subjects. It's quite an honor. That's right. It's coming back to me now. During my interview at the CW Center, when I met Cynthia for the first time, under the pretense of her being Cindy, the psychiatrist, she mentioned something about the Winsworth Interactive Company expanding into medtech with the development of high-tech contact lenses. She also mentioned that they'd have a virtual informational overlay so the user can interact with the world on a whole new level but I guess it makes sense they'd turn that off for me. It would give me too much of an edge in the competition. You don't ever have to take the contacts out, the woman says. In fact, you won't be able to even if that's something you wanted they are now permanently fused to your iris. Amazing. It's like they gave me perpetual, instant laser eye surgery with just a pair of contact lenses. Now that my vision is clear, I can see that the woman is much older than me, well past middle age, with some light crow's feet and short curly brown hair. She is wearing a pale grayish green uniform, similar to the housekeeping staff, although she's clearly some sort of nurse. Where am I anyway? I ask, looking around the unfamiliar room. The massage room in the spa building. The woman says, You started off in the sick bay. But doctor, Rumsern thought you'd recover better in here, with the low lighting and relaxing atmosphere. Recover? Oh, that's right. The groomsman pretty much smashed my face into the floor after I tried to poke out his eye. I gingerly reach up to feel my face, terrified of what I might find. But instead of painful swelling, or a broken nose, or even a split lip, I just find smooth, unbroken skin and perfectly intact features, my face completely unaffected after the fight. As if sensing what I'm thinking, the woman passes me a small silver hand mirror. Then she walks over the side of the room and flips on a light switch, flooding the room with brilliant brightness. I gaze at the reflection in awe. My face is miraculously healed with not even the faintest sign of the beating it took barely an hour ago. In fact, I look better than I ever have, before radiant and refreshed, practically glowing, as if I was given the best facial known to mankind, several times over. How? Is all I can manage? High-tech contact lenses aren't the only nanotech medical advancements the Winsworth Interactive Company has been working on. The woman says with a smug smile, You were given two doses of Reuvaform. It's another beta product due for release next year. It can fix just about anything. Bruising, swelling, minor cuts, cartilage. They're still working on a version that mends bones and major organs, though. Those are way more complex. I bet those features are going to appear in Reuvaform, too. Luckily for you, all you had was a broken nose and some minor bruising and swelling, easy peasy with the current version. Wow. I guess Ruby was right when she said 
that the Winsworth family empire is far more powerful than anyone realizes. The incredible advancements they've made in VR gaming are one thing, but this is just next level. Anyway, you missed lunch, and your hair and makeup are up in 15 minutes, the woman says. Try to take it easy and unwind until then. How much pressure do you like during a massage? Light, medium, or firm? It's pointless arguing with her or saying that I am way too wired and on edge right now to possibly take it easy and unwind, so I just say light pressure, I guess. All right. Swedish massage it is, she says. Just, just close your eyes and relax. Relax. Ha. As if half an hour later, I'm sitting in a beauty salon chair in a room next door. The space is spacious and airy, lit with early afternoon natural sunlight, pouring in through French doors and several large bay windows. For all intents and purposes, it looks like any high-end beauty salon in New York or Paris or London, but the view of brightly colored parrots swooping through the undergrowth of the lush tropical jungle outside shatters that illusion. There's a manicure station at one end, with an entire wall covered in many rainbows of nail polishes, in every hue imaginable. There are three hairdressing stations lined up against one wall, like the one I'm sitting at now, with salon chairs and mirrors and sinks and hair dryers and more, a perfect replica of a normal hairdressing salon. I wonder did the Winsworths install all of this just for the wedding games tournament? Aw, oh, has this always been here, for Cynthia Winsworth's private use? I can totally imagine Cynthia and some of her ultra-rich girlfriends sipping cocktails and having their hair and nails done during a multi-million dollar girls' weekend on the island. The ridiculous amount of wealth these people have and the way they throw it around like dirt is literally disgusting. The mirror in front of me has been draped with a sheet of fabric, probably to stop me looking at my reflection and freaking out if I don't like what's being done to my hair or face. It's a pity the groomsman, who escorted me here from the massage room, is probably lingering somewhere behind me near the door, and it would be useful to be able to covertly keep an eye on him in the reflection. There's a bustling and commotion in the doorway behind me, and I turn around to see the rest of the girls walk in, escorted by the remaining groomsmen. There are some looks of surprise and relief, although Andrea is visibly irritated and disappointed to see that I'm still in the competition and alive, for that matter. Cynthia walks in several seconds later and smiles when she sees me, giving me a quick wink before she addresses us. Welcome to my own personal beauty parlor, girls. Cynthia says. Now, half of you will start with hair, while the other half will have manicures and pedicures first. Xiu Mei and Mara, please join Valerie and take a seat at the hairdressing stations. Andrea Kim, Svetlana, please make your way to the pedicure stations. The girls do as she instructs, and Xiu Mei and Kim settle down into the salon chairs on either side of me. Then a line of about half a dozen men, and women dressed in grayish-green uniforms, walks through the door, taking their places at the various stations round the room. During these makeovers, you will be permitted to suggest certain aspects of your final look such as nail length and shape, nail polish hue, hair color shade, and cut, etc., and will also be allowed to ask the professionals for guidance on these matters. Cynthia says. However, the decision on what changes are made lies first with the professional and ultimately with me, should anything truly radical be suggested. Although I want to see how much taste and judgment you yourselves have in these matters, I also need to ensure that each of you is given the best makeover possible. My advice to you all would simply be to leave every aspect of these decisions to the various professionals and give no input yourselves at all. Think of yourselves as the clay to be molded by these talented artists, these Michelangelos of the blusher brush, 
and the flat iron. Now, apart from discussing the details of your makeover, there are certain subjects that you are expressly forbidden from broaching with the professionals who will be working on you today. Her voice abruptly loses its fake cheerful chirpiness and turns ice cold, dropping a couple of degrees to below zero freezing, chilling me to my bones with a sharp menace lurking beneath. Girls, the artists working on you today, are top celebrity hairdressers, makeup artists and beauticians sourced from all over the world, brought here expressly to lend their expertise to our wedding games. Cynthia tells us, I would like to make something perfectly clear to all of you girls. Don't get any ideas about them. Each of these people is on the Winsworth Interactive Company's payroll and are being paid a very generous fee for their participation and cooperation, which includes their silence. In other words, girls, we own them, just as we own you, each and every one. They are fully aware of the situation and asking them for help, or to save you will get you absolutely nowhere. Don't even try it, or you'll suffer the consequences, like Valerie over here. How was your nap, dear? She looks over at me as she says this, pursing her lips as if holding back laughter or wry amusement. I don't answer her, but I clench my fists in my lap, feeling my heart begin to hammer in my chest. She knows I was talking to Ruby, trying to get her to help me escape when we were in the fitting room together earlier. They must have interrogated her after I attacked the groomsmen. I really hope they didn't hurt her because of what I did. Now, my girls, while you all are being beautified, those of you who needed alterations made to your dresses might be called away from time to time for additional fittings next door, Cynthia says. And if you absolutely must use the ablutions facilities, let Todd know and one of the groomsmen will escort you. At 7 p.m., we will present your final transformations, so make this time count, girls. I expect each and every one of you to be reborn as a beautiful butterfly of unparalleled elegance and allure when I see you next now begin. No sooner has Cynthia left the room then the beauty staff spring into action. A skinny, chic-looking middle-aged man with a gray goatee and pierced ears pulls the sheet of fabric away from the mirror before me and smiles at me in the reflection as I squirm uncomfortably in the seat. It's a pleasure to meet you, Valerie. He says in a thick Italian accent, My name is Lorenzo, and I'll be transforming your hair this afternoon. He runs his fingers through my shoulder-length dark blonde locks, making disapproving tisk-tisk sounds as he does so. Oh my God! Porca miseria! He mutters under his breath. The condition is marvelous, clearly virgin hair, never colored bellissimo, but this cut so straight and flat, shapeless, no style at all, like a schoolgirl. When was the last time you visited a hairdresser? Yeah, ma'am, I murmur, scouring my memory for the answer. The last time I remember visiting a hairdressing salon was with my mom before I left for art school at 18. Maybe about six years ago. I've just been cutting it myself ever since. His pale gray eyes seem to bulge in alarm, and he shakes his head in disbelief. Oh, my poor darling. He sighs. You are very fortunate that you were assigned to me, the number one hair stylist in Italy, if not on the entire planet. Tell me are you happy to give me free reign, to do whatever I wish with this untamed mane of yours? Do you trust me? Now, that's a loaded question. Of course I don't trust this man he's, working for the Winsworths, playing along willingly with their demented game. But, as far as my hair goes, I'm a hundred percent certain that he has a way better idea than I myself do of what would suit me. He's got a reputation to uphold, and based on what Cynthia said about the BT professionals assembled here, being the very best in their respective fields, right now, I'm not the only one in a competition against my peers. 
Each single one of these hairdressers, manicurists, and beauticians is competing against each other to be the very best, to have their work chosen as the winner. So it makes total sense for me to put my faith in him and let this pro hairdresser do whatever he feels best. I'll leave it to you. I say, do whatever you want. Go wild. I mean, not too wild, but you know what I mean. Excellent. Lorenzo says with a smile, before calling out, Moro. To someone behind him, his assistant, presumably. A younger man in a matching grayish-green uniform hurries over, and Lorenzo speaks to him in a quick stream of Italian. Then they set off to work, mixing various strong-smelling substances in little bowls, and layering numerous foils into my hair, until I look like I'm wearing some sort of ridiculous giant silver helmet. I wonder what color they're making it. Maybe a deep crimson red like Svetlana's. Brunette black platinum. I'm honestly not sure that I could pull any of those colors off. Shoe mice long, silky black hair is being colored a dark chestnut brown, from the looks of it, while Mara's hairdressers are cutting her shoulder-length brunette locks into a daring layered bob, a massive departure from her previous style. After having me sit under a heat lamp for a quarter of an hour, Lorenzo and Mara remove my foils and take me to the shampoo basin, where Moro washes my hair and gives me a ten-minute head massage. Then I'm back in the chair, and Lorenzo is combing out my wet locks. To my surprise and relief, I can see I'm still blonde if not blonder. It's hard to know for sure with my hair still damp, but I think my hair is a few shades lighter and warmer in tone, where, before it was old gold, it's now closer to buttery sunshine, blonde. Lorenzo begins cutting, going at my locks with a pair of small silver scissors, and I pretty much say my prayers, hoping that he doesn't attempt anything too crazy like a super short pixie, cut, a one asymmetrical Karen haircut, or the like. He takes ages cutting my hair, then blow drying it and adding subtle waves. As a finishing touch, he twists my hair back and pins it into an elegant low chignon with loose tendrils framing my face. By the time he's done, I'm in awe of the final result. My previously plain, shapeless curtain of dark mousy blonde hair has been transformed into a gorgeous layered light champagne blonde mane, carefully styled to perfection. I haven't lost any length, but I've gained volume and brilliant silky shine. Now. I really feel like Grace Kelly or some other golden era Hollywood actress. My work here is done, me amore. Lorenzo says with a quick smile, leaning over to plant a quick kiss on my cheek as I sit in the salon chair. I will leave you in the care of Celeste, who will be taking care of your makeup. Good luck, my dove. You better win this for me. Ciao for now. I hope we will meet again. The makeup artist takes Lorenzo's place, standing behind my salon chair. Anything in particular you had in mind for your bridal makeup? She asks. Nope, just go for it. I say. She smiles enthusiastically, then sets to work applying numerous creams and serums, tweezing, plucking, lifting, contouring, applying foundation, concealer, mascara, and so on, until almost an hour later, I am utterly transformed. She's gone for a soft rosy matte palette, beautifully ethereal and fresh. Minimal eyeliner and long dark lashes are paired with a gorgeous rosy lip and subtle cherry blossom, pink blush cheek, creating a barely there, natural look. I don't think I've ever looked so beautiful in my life. If only Wyatt and that man-stealing BTCH Lexi could see me now, I think to myself, before pushing away the thoughts of my cheating ex-boyfriend and his new beau, my former art school professor. You can head over to Nails now, the makeup artist says, and I take my place at a manicure station, opposite a young woman. She examines my nails for a bit, 
admiring the length and saying that I have lovely long nail beds. And I just nod, pretending to know what that means. I've always had really hard, strong nails that grow ridiculously long, unless I cut them short. I usually do keep them trimmed, especially because longer nails can get in the way when holding a pencil or an eraser, not the best thing for a full-time concept artist. But the past few months have been hectic, and I haven't been drawing while unemployed, so they've grown out. What sorts of colors do you like? The girl asks me, pointing at the nail varnish display. Behind her this time, I decide not to let the professional pick out colors. For me, I feel confident to select my own hue. I point out a bottle of pale pink polish with subtle, sheer finish and the girl smiles as she fetches it. Ballet slippers by Essie. She says approvingly. A classic and how do you want your nails shaped? She shows me a chart and I point out the almond nails, which look timeless and elegant. Then she sets to work on the manicure and pedicure. The sun streaming in through the French doors has turned to the soft golden syrupy light of late afternoon by the time she's done. One of the groomsmen comes to escort me back to the auditorium, where I will be dressed and prepared for the judging ceremony. Both Kim and Andrea seem to have already left before me, and the others remain in the beauty parlor, having their finishing touches applied. To my surprise, instead of us walking to the main house, by the gardens, outside of the spa building, the groomsman stops in front of a wooden door, just outside the parlor room, and he presses his index finger to the touchpad. The door unlocks and we enter a corridor. Some way down the corridor, we reach the top of a stairwell, and we walk down a flight of steps until we reach a deeper walkway, a tunnel, I now realize. Is the entire house connected by underground tunnels? This is insane. We walk down the well-lit corridor for some time, passing numerous doors until we pass the room from, which I tried to escape earlier. Theater dressing room one. We eventually emerge into the stage wings, and I'm taken to the same impromptu black velvet curtained, fitting room, I used this morning. My attendant this time is an unfamiliar older woman. Ruby is nowhere in sight. In solemn silence, the fitting room assistant brings out my magnificent white wedding dress and zips me up into it, arranging my long flowing veil carefully over my expertly styled locks. She instructs me to step into the pair of ivory leather, Christian Louboutin stilettos, with pale powder blue soles that I selected earlier, then delicately secures each of the lustrous pearl drop earrings. The final touch she steps back awaiting my response, and I nod, dismissing her. She hurries out of the fitting room then, leaving me alone. I stare at my reflection in the full-length mirror, scrutinizing the unfamiliar beauty who gazes back at me. I look undeniably exquisite, but do I look exquisite enough to win this challenge? It's the moment of truth, I guess. Half an hour later, I'm lined up on the stage, alongside the other girls, illuminated under the bright glare of the overhead stage lights. Each one of us is dressed up in our chosen wedding dresses, veils and jewelry, and the makeovers are honestly astonishing. Svetlana was beautiful before, but now she looks like a supermodel. The hairdresser left her hair its same distinctive crimson red as before, but now her bright tresses are swirled into a classic, almost architectural chignon. She's wearing a stunning avant-garde gown, which only someone with her sensational figure and confidence could pull off the sumptuous white satin hugs, every curve of her body, with a plunging neckline, flowing into a graceful shawl, which reminds me of a lily unfurling its creamy petals. She is luxury personified. She's paired the gown with a dramatic cathedral, length veil, that trails several feet on the floor behind her. A shorter girl, like Mara, would be swamped by such a long veil, but on Svetlana, it emphasizes her height 
and stately elegance. Standing. Next to her is Kim, in a far simpler, but no less lovely dress. Crafted from white duchesse satin, her gown has a simple bodice, framed with a sweetheart neckline, an empire waist and a softly gathered and pleated skirt. Behind her simple drop veil, I can see that she, or the makeup artist, perhaps decided on bright metallic gold eyeshadow and a neutral lip to contrast with her dark skin a striking look, greatly enhancing her exquisite natural beauty. Her curly black hair is accessorized with a delicate gold chain headpiece matching her eyeshadow. Xu Mei is wearing an open-backed embroidered tulle and crepe gown cut from fluid white fabric that cascades poetically to a pooling train with sheer lace panels covered in delicate floral embroidery and diaphanous georgette ties. She's paired it with a waterfall veil, which tumbles gracefully over her slender shoulders. Her formerly jet black hair is now a warmer chestnut brown tied back in a fishtail braid, dotted with tiny white flowers, and the new shade suits her perfectly, a much more harmonious match for her fawn complexion and lovely dark brown eyes. I'm next in line, and to my right stands and rear in a short face-framing birdcage veil and a very modern midi-length bridal gown. Although her dress choice is fairly risky with a dramatic halter neck, a column skirt, and barely their floral hand-stitching trailing down from the bodice shiz, probably safe, considering what Mara is wearing. Mara, at the end of the line, has chosen a surprising combination. She's opted for a strapless mini-dress style, with a small bow detail on the hip, which I would have thought is an obvious mistake, given how similar it is to her bridal candidate uniforms. Cynthia said several times that the whole point of this challenge is to show a noticeable transformation, so choosing a dress similar to what we already wear every day sort of defeats the purpose. In contrast to the minimalistic mini dress, Mara's three-tier polka dot veil, edged with satin, is excessively busy and complicated. Cynthia said that there were a few vintage pieces amongst the selection of dresses and accessories, and I'm guessing this veil is from the 1980s, possibly thrown into the mix as a sort of booby trap to weed out those with poor taste. The jeweler is shiz, chosen isn't much better. An elaborate, modern Art Deco style emerald and diamond necklace with mismatched pink sapphire chandelier earrings. The cherry on top of the clashing look is Mara's choice of unflattering nail polish and makeup. She selected a bright fire engine red nail varnish and dramatic red lipstick, which doesn't suit her olive complexion, along with a dark, heavy smoky eye more appropriate for clubbing than walking down the aisle. The makeup itself is stunning and expertly done, but totally out of place given the situation. So out of place, in fact, that it seems almost intentional. I wonder, as I recall, Mara was beautifully dressed on the private jet in beige cashmere and pearls. This strange combination of styles is a far cry from the elegant understated look she favored before. Is it possible that she's intentionally trying to lose? No way. Surely not. I'm interrupted from my thoughts by Todd calling out. Groomsmen, it's time. From somewhere in the stage wings, before the heavy red velvet stage curtains begin to rise. In an alcove one level up directly next to the stage, the three judges are sitting along a narrow table, draped with lush black velvet skirting, a small tabletop microphone placed before each of them. Franklin and Cynthia Winsworth are smiling down at us, but Oliver is sitting unnaturally still, and I realize why a moment later. He's blindfolded, a thick strip of black silk, tied over his eyes as he sits impassively alongside his parents. Good evening, my butterflies. Franklin Winsworth speaks into his table mic. Congratulations on making it to round two of the wedding games. You all look utterly splendid, 
but there can be only one winner tonight. Now, for those of you wondering why my son Oliver has been blindfolded, fear not, you shall all have the chance to show your incredible transformations to him shortly, after you change out of your bridal wear and back into your bridal candidate uniforms. As I'm sure you must all know it's bad luck for the groom to see his future wife in her wedding dress before the big day. So, my wife and I alone shall begin by judging your entire wedding day looks and thereafter, you will change into your daily attire before Oliver gets a glimpse. Todd lift the veils. Todd walks down the row and lifts our veils one by one, revealing our faces for inspection. Up above in the judges' gallery, Franklin and Cynthia are scrutinizing you each, in turn through pairs of old-fashioned opera glasses, like little golden binoculars, pressed to their faces. They put the opera glasses down from time to time to converse, or to write on sheets of paper, maybe marking down notes or scores. We are each made to turn around, so that the judges can see the backs of each dress, as though we were in some pageant or fashion show. Finally, Cynthia taps on her microphone and speaks. Thank you, girls, she says. You may now change back into your bridal candidate uniforms, and we will reconvene in a quarter of an hour. The groomsmen file onto the stage and escort us to the makeshift fitting rooms in the wings. The attendant works quickly to get me out of the elaborate dress and veil, careful not to ruin my expertly styled Lo Chignon hairstyle or meticulously applied makeup. At one point, I automatically reach up to my face out of habit, wanting to remove my glasses so they don't get knocked off my face while changing, but then I remember about my new permanent contact lenses. I guess they have their perks, after all. Fifteen minutes later, I'm once again lined up on the stage, alongside the other girls. Oliver's black silken, blindfold, has been removed, and he stares down at us grimly. Again, it might just be my imagination, but I feel as though his eyes are fixed on me, and me alone. Thanks to my newly enhanced eyesight, I can make out the finer details of his expression, as though he were standing just a few feet away from me not fifty feet away. Is it really possible that he recognizes me from that day? We got stuck together in the elevator at White Star Gaming Studios. He's a drop-dead gorgeous billionaire after all, the heir to a massive multinational business empire. Surely, he wouldn't remember a random run-in with some weeping, clumsy girl in an office building three months ago. But my doubts are cleared as soon as Cynthia passes Oliver a pair of the small golden opera glasses and encourages him to inspect his potential brides. He scowls at his mother and reluctantly takes the glasses, then immediately trains them on me. I begin to blush under his gaze, the color only leaving my cheeks, when he finally puts the opera glasses down on the table and says something to his parents. The judges rise as a group and several minutes later, they emerge from the stage wings and walk across the stage towards us, stopping about ten feet away. Now that I'm in close proximity to Oliver again, I'm struck once more by how tall, lean and athletic, he is the tailored black tuxedo, is unable to hide his incredibly toned body. His skin is lightly tan, contrasting with his dark tousled hair, and bright green eyes. If it weren't for him being the son of demented maniacs, I might actually be attracted to him. His handsome face is wearing a strange expression as he stares at me, ignoring the other girls, as though he and I were the only ones standing on the stage. It's a look of astonishment mixed with awe and something else. Is it pain, perhaps? Regret? No, it's fear. He's either afraid for me of me, and I'm pretty sure it's the former. Oh no, is he afraid for me, because I'm tonight's loser. Am I about to be eliminated? The judges have made their decisions. Cynthia says, I'm pleased to say the vote tonight was unanimous. The girl who we have chosen was a natural beauty, 
before, but she was far from having recognized her own immense potential. Now her true beauty is unveiled. She has emerged a beautiful butterfly, utterly exquisite, and by far the most alluring young lady of the lot. Oliver will now perform the proposal ceremony and present the engagement ring to this round's fiancé Oliver. I hold my breath as Oliver begins to walk across the stage towards us. Who will he pick? Could it be? <laughs>